Good afternoon. This hearing will come to order. Welcome to our subcommittee members and witnesses testifying before us today. In connection with today's hearing, I welcome the members of the full committee who are not members of the subcommittee who are or will be attending. I ask unanimous consent that these committee members be permitted to participate in this hearing with the understanding that all sitting subcommittee members will be recognized for questions prior to those not assigned to the subcommittee. Without objection, so ordered. One of the objectives of this subcommittee is to bring attention to programs or activities which face management challenges, are too costly, or could be administered better. Given the pressures on the budget of the Department of Defense, every dollar counts. We cannot afford to make avoidable mistakes. Vigorous oversight can help ensure that mistakes don't happen, and when they inevitably do, we learn lessons from these missteps. For this reason, I'm happy to convene this hearing today on several recent reports highlighting deficiencies within the department. Last month, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction released a report assessing that the department overpaid as much as $28 million on uniforms for the Afghan National Army. Furthermore, the pattern selected by the Afghan Minister of Defense may not even be appropriate for Afghanistan's environment. I understand it's important to listen to and work collabor collaboratively with our partner nations when we are helping to train and outfit their forces, but I am eager to know specifically how to avoid similar missteps in the future. I want to know what the department is doing to ensure that Afghan troops are appropriately outfitted at a price that is right for the U.S. taxpayer. On Friday, the Secretary of Defense sent a very strongly worded memorandum to his senior most deputies. In light of the Afghan uniform report, the Secretary directed them to, quote, bring to light wasteful practices and take aggressive steps to end waste in our department, unquote. This is essential. Other recent reports by the Government Accountability Office and the Department of Defense Inspector General, General identified issues with the management of equipment funded by the Iraq Train and Equip Fund, or ITEF. GAO determined that DOD had difficulty tracking and accounting for material as it was procured, shipped to the theater, and then provided to Iraq's security forces. Similarly, the Department of Defense's Inspector General has conducted two inquiries which determined that the Army had ineffective controls for processing, transferring, and securing ITAF equipment in Iraq. The Department must improve its monitoring and management of this equipment to be more accurate and transparent. I applaud the Army for already taking steps to do so. I look forward to hearing what progress the Department has made in continuing to remedy these various deficiencies. R vigorous oversight can ensure that hard-earned taxpayer dollars are being put in good use uh, in securing our nation's defense. Our first panel will address the findings and recommendations of the various reports. Our second panel will address how the Department is working to overcome the many challenges inherent to executing train and equip programs. So I now turn to my colleague, Ranking Member Moulton, for his introductory remarks. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. You know, this situation with the uh, Afghan uniforms uh, reminds me of when I was in the Kuwaiti desert uh, with my platoon, and we were getting ready to invade Iraq. And a few days before we invaded, fully anticipating to be hit with chemical weapons, we were issued our chemical weapons suits, and we ripped open the black plastic packages we took out green camouflage chemical weapon suits to invade Iraq. Now, this is back in the axis of evil days, and so we joked that they must be saving the desert ones for Korea. But you would think that we would learn from mistakes like that, and yet a few years later, we see this happening again when it's completely within our control. The uniforms that were issued to uh, the Afghan National Army uh, have been deemed inappropriate for 97% of Afghanistan. At the same time, there were desert pattern uniforms owned by the Department of Defense that would have been perfectly appropriate. In response to this investigation, the House Armed Services Committee has acted and included a provision in the FY18 NDAA that would require DOD to perform both cost and requirements analyses before awarding any new contract for uniforms in Afghanistan. 
It's designed to ensure this particular mistake never happens again, but I want to ensure this oversight body hears from you about whether you believe that's the case, whether it will work, and whether there's much more we should be doing. We need to get to the bottom of what went wrong. I can't tell you what I could do with $26 million in my district. I'd also like to hear your thoughts on what we should do now that we've bought these uniforms for the Afghan forces and whether or not it makes sense to use additional taxpayer funds to buy replacements. It's easy to conclude that the Defense Department did not subject this decision to sufficient supervision or oversight. But it's also important to say that DOD regularly complains that Congress imposes onerous reporting requirements and other oversight measures that take too much time, require too much bureaucracy, and hurt the operational efficiency of our military. We don't want to do that, but these are the kinds of situations that demand it. Therefore, we want to better understand how these decisions were made and the broader policy changes you would recommend to prevent these outrageous mistakes in the future. In the absence of good answers, we will demand stricter oversight, and we will get into the weeds. My hope is that we can eventually gain the confidence that DOD will prevent the massive waste of taxpayer dollars in the future without requiring us to impose more bureaucratic oversight on daily operations. The second set of findings in some ways should concern us even more. If we're not adequately tracking and securing the weapons and equipment we send to our allies in Iraq or Afghanistan or anywhere else, that endangers the critical efforts of the Iraqi security forces to defeat ISIS and ensure they are able to stabilize the country after combat operations are complete. Both the Department of Defense's own Inspector General as well as the GAO have concluded that there are serious shortcomings in remaining in our ability to sufficiently track and account for the weapons and other hardware we are, uh, we are providing via the Iraq Train and Equip Fund, or ITEF. More specifically, the GAO found the Department of Defense maintains only, quote, limited visibility and accountability over equipment funded by ITEF, end quote, and that a key tracking system is, quote, not consistently capturing key transportation dates of ITEF equipment. Again, I myself have been responsible for delivering ammunition, weapons, and other equipment to the Iraqi security forces. My team and I maintained strict accountability of what was delivered and showed up to inspect those deliveries. We held our Iraqi leaders, our counterparts, accountable. We made them sign for everything, and we followed up with other inspections to make sure that they still had the inventory they accepted. We can do this. We can do it right, and we need to do it, and the American taxpayer deserves it not to mention our troops in the field who certainly don't want to find themselves targeted by our own superior weapons and equipment. Some progress has been made, but I'm eager to hear more specifics about how we can ensure that hundreds of millions of dollars in weapons and equipment are indeed accounted for and confirmed as properly delivered where intended. I thank you for your oversight work and I look forward to your testimony today. And with that, I yield back. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Moulton. And I'm pleased to recognize our witnesses today, and I want to thank them for taking time to be with us. We have the Honorable John Sopko, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, Mr. Michael Rourke, the Assistant Inspector General for the Contract Management and Payments Directorate at the Department of Defense Inspector General, and Ms. Jessica Farb, Director on the International Affairs and Trade Team at the Government Accountability Office. So we will now hear your opening statements. Mr. Sopko, uh, we'll begin with you. Thank you very much. Chairman Hartzler, Ranking Member Moulton, and members of the subcommittee and committee. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here again to discuss SIGAR's work in Afghanistan, and in particular, the purchase of uniforms for the Afghan National Army by the Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan commonly referred to as C-STICA, which is responsible for the bulk of the training, advising, and assisting of the Afghan security forces there. C-STICA, as you alluded to, procured over one million ANA uniforms with a proprietary pattern without testing its effectiveness and costing up to $28 million more than needed. As Secretary Mattis recently noted, quote, the key findings of the SIGAR report is not just that it exposes waste, 
but rather it serves as an example of a complacent mode of thinking. He also refers to it as a cavalier attitude toward the expenditure of taxpayer funds. This $93 million procurement demonstrates what happens when people in the government don't follow the rules. Now, I'd like to highlight 10 specific areas of concern for you to consider. At first, it appears that C. Sticka only showed the Afghan Minister of Defense proprietary camouflage patterns owned by one company, a Canadian company called Hyperstealth. Secondly, C. Sticka failed to consider other available camouflage patterns, including those owned by the Department of Defense, which would have been cheaper and perhaps equally effective. Third, C. Sticka never tested the hyperstealth pattern for its effectiveness in Afghanistan. C. Sticka never justified the uniform requirements, which made those uniforms more costly than those used by other Afghan units and paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. C. Sticka recommended using a sole source award to hyperstealth, even though DOD contracting officers objected. C. Sticka got around those objections by using a de facto sole source process, which required whomever won the prime contract to use the hyperstealth pattern. C. Sticka also mysteriously alerted hyperstealth to quote unquote wait by the phone for a call from the Atlantic Dive Supply Company, also known as ADS, who ultimately purchased the exclusive license for their camouflage pattern in Afghanistan. Now, federal regulations dictate that brand name acquisitions like this require market research and require a justification. C. Sticka did neither. In addition, we found that C. Sticka was unable to determine the total amount of direct assistance spent on procuring ANA uniforms, nor the amount of uniforms actually purchased due to poor oversight and poor record keeping. And lastly, an area of concern is that we uncovered that the Afghans did not adhere to the Berry Amendment which requires the purchase of only U.S. textiles when procuring ANA uniforms with direct assistance. Instead, the Afghans used U.S. taxpayer dollars to purchase inferior Chinese textiles for their uniforms. Now, these problems, Madam Chairman, are serious. They are so serious that we started a criminal investigation related to the procurement of the ANA uniforms. But I must say, as a result of our work, and as a result of conversations we've had with OSD policy about other issues, that I want to announce today that we believe it is prudent to review all of C. Sticka's contracts related to the procurement of organizational clothing and individual equipment in Afghanistan. We are pleased that OSD policy concurred with the report's recommendations. Because if unmodified, this procurement, if it continues, will needlessly cost the taxpayer an additional $72 million over the next 10 years. I'd also like to thank my colleagues in OSD policy for identifying some contracts they believe ripe for oversight. I would also like to thank this committee and the committee members who recently voted for that amendment mandating a review of the cost-benefit analysis of this contract. I'd also like to encourage the subcommittee to ensure DOD conducts proper oversight that addresses the broader problems that SIGAR identifies in its work. As we all know, oversight is mission critical, and we cannot afford to wait until we waste millions of dollars to try to fix it. Finally, I'd like to thank Secretary Mattis for his support and leadership, as shown by his recent memo to senior DOD officials supporting SIGAR's findings and reiterating the need to, quote, take aggressive action to end waste in the Department of Defense. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Rourke. 
Chairwoman Hartzler, Ranking Member Moulton, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss our two audits on Iraq train and equip fund equipment. We initiated these two audits in 2016 based on concerns identified during previous audits in Kuwait for Operation Inherent Resolve and a request from the Army's First Theater Sustainment Command, or First TSC, to review its policies and procedures for the ITEF mission. Our first audit focused on whether the Army had effective controls for processing and transferring ITEF equipment to the Government of Iraq, or GOI. And our second audit focused on the procedures for securing ITEF equipment, including weapons, in Kuwait and Iraq. Congress created ITEF in 2014 to assist the GOI to combat the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria by providing assistance for training, equipment, logistics support, and supplies and services. Examples of ITEF equipment include body armor, weapons, and cargo trucks. Army regulations require maintaining visibility and accountability, securing and conducting inventories of equipment. The Army's first TSC has primary responsibility for maintaining visibility and property accountability of ITEF equipment transferred to Iraq. ITEF equipment is typically staged in Kuwait and then shipped to multiple transfer sites in Iraq. Our first audit found that the first TSC did not have complete visibility and accountability of ITEF equipment prior to transfer to the Iraqis because the command did not use automated systems to keep track of that equipment. Specifically, we found two problems with accountability. First, the first TSC could not provide complete data for the quantity and dollar value of equipment on hand, including vehicles and ammunition. Instead, the first TSC relied on multiple spreadsheets developed by different commands in both Kuwait and Iraq to provide visibility and accountability. When we requested the quantity and dollar value of equipment on hand and that had been transferred to the GOI, the first TSC had to contact various officials and manually calculate the data based on multiple spreadsheets and systems. And even after that, their response was still incomplete. I'm sorry, Mr. Rourke. Could you just tell us what a TSE is, please? The first theater sustainment command is the Army command in Kuwait that's responsible for keeping track of the equipment. Thank you. Second, the first TSE did not consistently account for equipment in Iraq. In some cases, they did not enter the property into property records when it initially arrived in country, or they sent it to Iraq and considered that it was already transferred to the Iraqis, although it could still be under US control. As a result, the first TSC did not have accurate up-to-date records on the quantity and dollar value of Iraq equipment that we valued at over $1 billion. As a result of our audit, the first TSC developed a shared spreadsheet for all commands to use to keep track of ITEF equipment, and then in the long term, they initiated steps to use automated systems by late 2016. Our second audit focused on inventory and security procedures for ITEF weapons. As of October 2016, there were over 11,000 ITEF weapons valued at $17.7 .7 million in Kuwait and over 2,900 ITEF weapons valued at $2.3 million at the one transfer site in Iraq that we visited. Examples of these weapons included M16 rifles, M14 sniper rifles, and 12-gauge shotguns. We found that the Army did not have effective procedures for conducting inventories and securing ITEF weapons in both Kuwait and Iraq. In Kuwait, we identified three main security problems. First, the Army did not consistently conduct inventories of weapons. Second, and most concerning, ITEF weapons were stored in cardboard boxes, some of which had holes in them or had partially collapsed. Weapons were also stored in wooden crates that were not banded or locked. As a result, we were able to open numerous boxes and expose their contents. Third, we observed Syrian equipment managed by Army contractors that was stored right alongside ITEF equipment with no physical barrier separating the two. In response to our audit, the Army established inventory and security procedures for the Kuwait warehouse and then reorganized the warehouse to separate the ITEF and Syrian equipment. In Iraq, we found that the Army did not effectively secure ITEF weapons at the site we visited in accordance with Army regulations. Specifically, incoming weapons were stored at a storage yard that had per a perimeter fence with multiple holes in it large enough to grant unauthorized access. As a result of our audit, the command repaired the fence and then later moved the equipment to a secured location. During the audits, the Army commands that we dealt with were very receptive to our recommendations and initiated steps to implement corrective actions. These two audits continued our longstanding practice of informing commands in a contingency environment of our observations during the audit to allow them to make real-time corrective actions 
rather than waiting for a final report to be issued months later. This concludes my statement and I'm prepared to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Farb. Chairwoman Hartzler, Ranking Member Moulton, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our May 2017 report on DOD's accountability for equipment provided through the Iraq Train and Equip Fund, or ITEF. Congress created ITEF to provide equipment and other assistance to Iraq security forces to counter the expansion of ISIS. As of December 2016, DOD had dispersed about $2 billion of the $2.3 billion Congress appropriated for ITEF in fiscal years 2015 and 2016. These funds purchased personal protective equipment, weapons, and vehicles for these forces, among other things. We found that DOD does not collect timely and accurate information on the status of equipment purchased through the fund. As a result, DOD cannot demonstrate that this equipment reached its intended destinations in Iraq. Specifically, DOD does not ensure that SCIP, the Security Cooperation Information Portal, consistently captures key transportation dates of ITEF-funded equipment. SCIP is designed to provide end-to-end -end visibility over equipment that DOD provides to foreign governments. For Iraq, SCIP is intended to provide visibility over equipment as it moves through three phases. Acquisition and shipment, staging in Kuwait and Iraq, and transfer to the government of Iraq or the Kurdistan regional government. We found that SCIP captured some of the key transportation dates for orders of equipment during the acquisition and, and shipping phases. However, SCIP captured none of the transportation dates for these orders during the staging and transfer phases. DOD officials attributed this to three potential interoperability and data reporting issues in SCIP. First, SCIP may not be importing key dates correctly from other DOD data systems. Second, SCIP's management report system may not be importing key dates from with other, within SCIP itself. And third, DOD component staff may not be recording key dates in SCIP. In some instances, staff are not required to do so, while in others, staff reported difficulty recording these dates in SCIP due to the lack of clear procedures in a designated data field. In addition to issues with reporting in SCIP, we also found that DOD cannot fully account for ITEF-funded equipment transferred to the government of Iraq or the Kurdistan regional government due to missing or incomplete documentation. Most of DOD's transfer documentation lack case identifier information, which is key to tracking equipment throughout each phase of the process. Although DOD issued a verbal order requiring the use of case identifiers, this was not incorporated into standard operating procedures for ensuring accountability. We made four recommendations in our report. First, we recommended that DOD develop written procedures that specify the data field to be used to capture equipment transfer dates and skip. Second, we recommended that the department develop written procedures for including case identifiers in the transfer documentation. Third, we recommended that DOD should identify the root causes of these problems, such as interoperability and data reporting issues within SCIP and other data systems. And fourth, we recommended that the department should develop an action plan with milestones and timeframes to address the root causes that they identify. DOD has already taken some steps to begin to address these recommendations. With respect to the first two recommendations, the department just this month provided us with updated procedures and we are in the process of evaluating whether they fully address GEO's recommendations. In response to our third and fourth recommendations, the department said that it has begun identifying the root causes of the data reporting issues in SCIP and will develop an action plan and time frame for addressing them. In addition, DOD has requested GEO's assistance to ensure that the issues we identified are appropriately resolved. We have recently started new work that will examine the disposition of ITEF-funded equipment after it has been transferred to the government of Iraq or the Kurdistan regional government. As we conduct this important analysis, we will continue to follow up on DOD's efforts to improve its accountability and visibility over ITEF-funded equipment. Chairwoman Hartzler, Ranking Member Moulton, and members of the subcommittee, this concludes my prepared remarks. I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, very good work on all your behalf. Appreciate you uh, looking into these, this very important issue of making sure our tax dollars are spent wisely and the equipment gets in the hands of those who really need it. Um, I wanted to start with um, you, Mr. Sopko. 
Um, so you address some, some new things. First of all, you provided all of us with some pictures here. Um, just wanted to, for the record and for the audience, uh, make sure that they, they see what we're seeing here as a uh, committee that up here on the, the left is the uh, pattern that was chosen um, that is proprietary. And the one on the right is the woodland battle dress uniform that goes to the Afghan Special Forces, I believe you said, that's non-proprietary. And all of these patterns down below are owned by the U.S. Department of Defense and wouldn't have cost the additional uh, money. Can you kind of walk through how you think uh, how this happened that we end up having this pattern here that looks like a forest, and that's what uh, the Afghanistan uh, security forces chose or wanted, uh, but yet we had these down here that were available at a uh, much more economical cost that have looked more like a, a sand environment and desert. So can you kind of walk us through the different patterns and how we came to have this in Afghanistan? Th thank you, and I'm happy to do that, Madam Chairman. Um, you're absolutely correct. Uh, this is the proprietary pattern. What that basically means is somebody owned that pattern, and the government has to pay a licensing fee for using it. Uh, the woodland pattern over here that the uh, that you pointed out uh, that I don't think that's a non-proprietary pattern, so we didn't have to pay for it. The, the, you asked the question, how did this happen? Well, that's part of our investigation, but it's pretty clear from our discussion with the C-STIC officials in reviewing the files. The reason it happened is that the uh, uh, Minister of Defense, Minister Wardock, never saw the DOD-owned patterns down below. He was basically shown only patterns owned by one company, the Canadian company that I mentioned previously. So that's why, I mean, this kind of reminds me of an old uh, joke about uh, buying a Model T. Henry Ford can say, you, you can get any car you want, uh, as long as it's black. Well, basically, we gave, the only options we gave the Minister of Defense was uh, the proprietary patterns. We never showed him this. The, the, the bigger problem is no one ever did an assessment as to what kind of camouflage is best in Afghanistan. And we talked to people who do that for a living. We talked to the military who do that for a living up in Massachusetts, and they said that's what you should do. You should look at the environment, and as a matter of fact, some of our military have two different uniforms, one for the desert and one for that small area where there is greenery. But that, was ne that option was never provided. Basically, what we were told by C. Sticka, and we are researching this right now, is the Minister of Defense liked this color, so he picked it. Now, some of the information I had read prior to this hearing said that one of the reasons that he chose that is he wanted it to be unique. He wanted it to be different than perhaps what uh, uh, U.S. might be wearing or others to uh, identify them. Um, so maybe he had that rationale, but I wanted to clarify, if, so if the U.S. Department of Defense owns these patterns down here, are they currently in use by our forces? No, they are not, and, and they're not used, and no one's using them in Afghanistan. We have patterns that look like it, but not exactly the same. So if he wanted a unique pattern, he could have picked one of these if he had been shown. Some are green, some are brown, or whatever color it is, but he could have picked those, and it wouldn't cost the government anything extra. Now, he you mentioned, uh, thank you. you mentioned that um, we need to uh, get to the bottom of this, or that in the future we could have $72 million uh, additional money that was overspent. Can you clarify what are you referring to there? Well, we're, we're locked into providing the Afghans with uniforms. Every new soldier, Afghan soldier, gets four new uniforms when he starts, and they get replaced on a regular basis. And the way it is now, the only pattern we can buy is the pattern owned by the, license, the company that owns the license. So we're locked into that. If we don't change this, we're going to pay extra, not just for the proprietary pattern, but the second part is they decided to have a more expensive uniform, a fancier uniform, more like the Americans. So it had zippers and a bunch of other things. They looked more fashionable. But no assessment was done why you needed that uniform for the Afghans. Do you know how long the contract is currently? 
Uh, I don't have that information right now. I could I can get that for you. Okay, very very good. Well, we appreciate um, appreciate you looking at that. Uh, I wanted to ask the other witnesses regarding the ITAF uh, issues that you you raised. Is it concerning to you that it took three separate reports before the Department of Defense, um, st you know, started agreeing to some of these changes, or would you say that they have been doing the the needed uh, changes and following your recommendations from from day one? Well, for our two reports, um, I think it's important to remember that uh, the command, the Army commands that we're discussing here today in Kuwait and Iraq uh, asked us to come in and take a look at their procedures. So, uh, you know, in late 2014, Congress created ITEF, and so then in 2015, uh, we were starting to procure equipment and so forth. And uh, so in, in 2016, when we did these two audits, they, they said, hey, I'm, I'm adopting this new mission. Can you come in and take a look at as an independent party, how, how we're doing and, and, rec and uh, you know, make recommendations for how we could improve. And so we did that, and we thought that uh, the commands were very receptive to our feedback and did take corrective actions in a timely manner. Great. Uh, my response would be similar. Um, they've been working with us. They asked for our assistance in helping us to implement the recommendations. They actually also asked for underlying data to help identify the particular problems we were pointing out within the data system that they provided. GEO has previously done work on um, the standard operating procedures issues throughout the, the, the theaters that we've um, been in, and um, we've seen in the past that they've you know, been very receptive to our recommendations. Um, and so we, we look forward to our future work in terms of looking at this. Very good. Uh, Ranking Member Moulton. Uh, thank, you very <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. So Mr. Inspector General, uh, You've mentioned that you are opening a criminal investigation into this incident. I mean, it certainly seems to me like uh, a place where we might just not find a mistake, but uh, fraud or other improprieties. What more should we be doing on this subcommittee uh, to get to the bottom of what went on here? Well, I, I would suggest that uh, hearings such as this are important. Um, Bringing the spotlight of oversight is important. I, I would suggest, and I, I had the good fortune to work for uh, Sam Nunn as well as for John Dingle, uh, the famous or infamous Dinglegrams uh, that went out. I wrote quite a few for Chairman Dingle. Uh, I think a Hartzellgram should get known around the Department of Defense in which hard, tough questions are asked. And we're happy to help you in addressing those questions. But one question you could ask, and I think the full committee should ask, is how many people identified by my office, by the DOD office, or by GAO have actually lost their jobs because of wasting taxpayers' dollars? Send that letter to the Department of Defense. And while you're at it, send one or have somebody send one to USAID and DOD and, and the Department of State. I bet you no one. We identify these problems. No one is held accountable. We make the recommendations, and they sound really good. And you get great procedures. Everything we identified were in the FAR. They totally ignored it. No one is being held accountable. Mr. Roark, can you comment on that? Has anyone been held accountable for this gross error, this gross negligence? Well, we uh, have been working on audits in Southwest Asia, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and in supporting countries like Kuwait for many years. And each time we write a report or do an audit, we do think about, does this, do the circumstances here meet uh, the need for an accountability recommendation uh, to hold someone accountable? But in the end, uh, as IGs, we can make a suggestion or recommendation to the command, but we, uh, the, it's up to the commands to take action on whether or not to hold someone accountable. So there, there are uh, pretty frequently uh, recommendations in DOD. I, I understand that, DOD. but do you know in this instance, has anyone been held accountable? In this instance, I'm not aware of any. Uh, Mr. Sopko, to, to, to go back to you, are there any specific uh, witnesses or other folks that you think that we should call before this committee uh, to help get to the bottom of what's going on here? Well, I, I would, uh, 
I would ask if you don't call any other witnesses until we get to the bottom of the criminality, but uh, mm -hmm. there are some probably, some of the contractors, some of the contracting officers, but uh, uh, I'm happy to sit down and discuss names of people uh, 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 privately, but uh, again, we're, we're opening up an investigation. Uh, it's just in the beginning stage, uh, so uh, we can work with the committee if you want to talk about people, but uh, I would defer, at least on this case. But we have many other cases that we've closed. We're happy to give you the names, well, we will, uh, we will locations take. of people who, remember, I have no subpoena authority over an individual. I cannot compel testimony. Okay? We will and take I, you up on that yeah, offer. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Now, stepping back from this specific instance, can you comment on some of your observations? You've been doing this job for a long time on the broader circumstances that lead to these situations. The Armed Services Committee of the House of Representatives should not have to pass a specific provision in our law to detail the supervision of the purchasing of uh, uniforms for the Afghan National Army. I mean, at a certain level, that's absurd. We ought to just have an environment where these deficiencies, these mistakes are caught, where proper supervision exists from the beginning so that gross, uh, this gross waste of, tax, of taxpayer dollars simply never occurs. So can you comment on, on those broader, on the broader situation here? You, you know, the, the questions you're asking are the type of questions uh, I, I would love to discuss in more detail, and I think uh, we could have a broader hearing just about how to fix the government. Uh, I've been looking at it in We're this not trying to fix the whole government. Well, uh, well at least my little world for the last six years, and then I had 25 years on the Hill doing oversight, and I know the frustration you feel. But based upon my experience in Afghanistan, I think a couple things are very clear. Number one, there's no accountability. People are not being held accountable for wasting money. Uh, we occasionally indict people, but we only indict the slow and the lame. I mean, basically, that's about all we're getting. So people are not held accountable. We have a disincentive for good government. And I don't want to imply, first of all, that the people we send to Afghanistan are either very stupid or very venal. They're some of the best, bravest people in the world. But we have given our, our procurement people, our ambassadors, our generals, a box of broken tools. The same broken tools that you see in the press with the VA, with the Department of Energy, Department of Commerce, HHS, name it. Procurement is broken. HR is broken. Our rotation. We have what we call in Afghanistan the annual lobotomy. Every year we change everybody out. I think I've gone through eight or ten commanders of C-Sticka in the five and a half years that I've been there. Eight um, or ten. How many times was General Eisenhower replaced due to an annual rotation requirement? Zero. He was there the whole length of the duration. I know we could also talk about Vietnam. It may not be the best analogy, but what I'm saying is, and I don't want to be hated by every spouse of every senior military officer, but the problem is this annual rotation, and in some areas it's even uh, shorter. There are FBI agents, there are com commerce uh, officials, there are people there for just months at a time. They don't even know where the latrine is by the time they leave. So they're never held accountable for their screw-ups because they're not around when the screw-up is discovered by us. Because we usually don't get there. DODIG and GAO and my office is really good. But by the time we get there, it's like the detective show you've seen on TV. If we're lucky, there's a chalk outline of the body, but usually it's seven years old. Remember, this contract is, is seven to ten years. It's ongoing, but the problem started back then. So there has to be something done to fix our personnel system. There has to be something done to fix our procurement system. We have to stop this disincentive of spend money. I don't know how many contracting officers have told me I get rewarded at the end of the year on how much money I put on contract, not on whether the contract is good or not. We have to change that system. And I would highly recommend take a look at the HR system in the Defense Department, take a look at the procurement system, take a look at the incentives that you, 
are allowing to occur which create this problem. And that may be the first place and the best place to look. Look at the personnel system and look at the incentives. Great. Thank you very much. Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Mr. Gates. Thank you, Madam Chair. It appears as though we bought uniforms that didn't work and paid about $28 million more than we should have to do so. One of the reasons why that's so frustrating to all of us here on this panel is that we are the ones, Republicans and Democrats, who work hard every day to convince our colleagues that we need the resources in the Department of Defense to effectively protect the warfighter and military families. Circumstances like this undermine our bipartisan efforts uh, to support wife warfighters and their families. This appears to be either an event of stupidity or corruption. What is your assessment as to which of the two we are facing? Uh, I don't mean to dodge the question. That's why we're doing the investigation right now. It's either venality or it's stupidity. Or it's like I say, it's a system that was set up where the person who was working this contract was rewarded by getting the contract out. And Is there any evidence that these proprietary uniforms have greater capability than the non-proprietary patterns? We didn't look at that. I mean, we're not assessing whether the proprietary uniform is better or the, the camouflage pattern is better or not better. We're just saying that there were uh, proprietary uniforms. They're also non-proprietary. What is our current working theory as to why the customer was only shown the proprietary product of one Canadian company? We don't know. That's the why we're doing the investigation. And we have no mechanism to determine whether or not that is stupidity or corruption at this time. Well, we hope after the end of the criminal investigation we'll find that out, but uh, that's what we're in the process of doing right now, sir. What is your expectation on a timeline there? That is frustrating for me as for everyone else. It takes a long time. One of the problems is I don't have subpoena authority to compel somebody to talk to my agents. They can slam the door in their face. Is there any person that you wish you could subpoena now that you can't? Well, I can't subpoena anyone. Right. Who would be the first three people you would subpoena if you had that power? Well, I, I don't want to name names because I think that's sending the wrong message to do with the people we're investigating. I disagree. I think it sends exactly the right message. Well, but, I, I mean, our committee has subpoena power. So if the challenge is we have no time frame and we have no mechanism to find out whether people were stupid or corrupt, and we have subpoena power in the Congress and you don't, it seems as though a partnership here would be beneficial. Well, I am happy to discuss names... Uh, 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 privately, sir, at, at any time with the chairman or ranker or you. Well, Mr. Rourke, you indicated that you, your office has made accountability recommendations. Did those accountability recommendations name names? Uh, we use the position title of the person. You, that's usually how we do it. And would you be willing to provide those accountability recommendations to the subcommittee so that we might be able to see who the individuals are that you seem to believe ought to be held accountable? Uh, we can. Now, it, just for a clarification, the the accountability recommendations that, I, that I've issued in the past or for, are on that body of audits that I've done over time, not, for, not on this particular, uh, these two audits that we're discussing today. Uh, Mr. Rourke, I believe you gave testimony about weapons that were not properly guarded. In that particular circumstance, was there an accountability recommendation that came from your office? So for the, the weapons uh, storage issue, we, uh, we made uh, recommendations uh, in real time to the, uh, to the command, and oftentimes they fix that right away. Um, in, in, in Iraq, I'm, I'm thinking of the example where uh, they used the storage lot uh, that had holes in the fence, and really they were, that was the only yard that they were given, the only one that was available, and then they, they, uh, I think the reluctance to fix that at the time was that they knew that they were moving to a more secure location down the road, and so we kind of uh, uh, expedited uh, that by recommending that they fix the fence, no matter whether it was just for a short time or not, just because of the security risk there. And so in that in instance, was there an accountability recommendation tied to a specific individual? No, we, we did not make an accountability recommendation for that instance, we just uh, basically talked with the command and made recommendations with them and then wrote about that in our report and they fixed the problem in real time. So, And I'll go back to Mr. Asopko for my final question. Uh, will you, can you illuminate this committee as to any evidence of 
improper influence that this particular Canadian company may have had within our Department of Defense as it related to the sweetheart circumstances that led to their products being the only products shown to the customer? At, at this stage, I, I, I can't. We, 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 we haven't developed it that much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. O'Halloran. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I get, I, I'm new at this, and I'm sitting here in amazement, and we have just uh, approved a tremendous amount of money within this body here to go out and uh, fund new weapons, new uniforms, new, new uh, personnel, and yet we have a system before me that sounds like it's a um, systemic in its problems with uh, audit. Now, I know that the Secretary, when we were uh, listening to him at the beginning of the year, uh, made it clear that he understands that there's a problem within the system. But I can't believe that we haven't known that there's a problem within the system for a number of years. And, and so I, I'm... I'm and I'm confused by the, by the fact that uh, there's a trail of, of letters to a commander, uh, Mr. Mr. Rourke mentioned it, and is, there, is that commander required to send back to you the, the reason why they rejected what you want to have done or recommendations? So in, this, in these cases, they, the commanders did not reject our recommendations. They, they adopted them and agreed with them. But I think the process you're, dis you're discussing is follow-up. So we'll make a recommendation, and then the command will either, you know, either agree or disagree with it. In this case, they agreed and took action. However, uh, we don't take their, their word for it. We uh, either visit ourselves to do follow-up and make sure it was done, or we request documentation and photos uh, to, to prove that it was done so that we can close out that recommendation. Now, it was mentioned before that uh, about stupid or corrupt, and I, I just sitting here feel uh, that's going to happen in any system. Uh, but what can't happen in any system is that the system is broken and that the system is at, at play here. Uh, if, there, if, there, if you don't have enough auditing power, then let us know. But if we're at, at a, a level here where the taxpayer's money is being spent without any accountability or limited accountability, uh, then we have a, a real problem. Uh, so uh, my question is, uh, to what extent does the current organizational structure help to um, help the uh, department's ability to ensure accountability uh, for the program? A any witness? I mean, I, I, I'm not going to direct it. Um, You know, I, I may defer to my colleagues from DOD. I don't think the way the system is currently created helps accountability in the DOD, state, aid, or anywhere. Uh, I, I hate to say that. I, I don't. I, I'm. I'm usually not invited to parties like this because I always am the like the crazy uncle. You don't want them at the wedding. But it, it it's it's broken. Uh, I I hate to say it. The system is broken on accountability, because we're not holding people accountable, because by the time we get out there, the money has been spent, and the person who was involved is either retired or long gone, because there's a two-year or shorter appropriation cycle, and everyone's got the incentive to spend money. It's, we got to get a hold of how the government is working. It's not working quite well, uh, or as well as we would like to see it work. So how many times have you uh, requested that the system be changed uh, in written form or verbally or uh, to uh, people up the, up the ladder? Well, I, I'm like a broken record uh, in the last, this current job. Every time I've been asked to testify, and I think some of you have heard me testify before, I, I've talked about that, that what we need to fix is not Afghanistan and how we do in Afghanistan. We need to fix it back here. That, that, was my, that was what I thought needed to be done, that this is just a systemic problem throughout the process. But I'd like to know, any one of you, three of you, how you have worked to change it and so we can identify how many times within the, this group that there's been a request to change it and it hasn't been changed. 
I don't know if I should should hog the uh, the answer, but th this is also one of the problems. I'm the Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. I have no jurisdiction over OPM. I have no jurisdiction over the internal procurement at DOD, although the GAO has had defense procurement on the high risk list since 1991. I mean, that's kind of telling you we have a problem with DOD procurement, but I have no jurisdiction. That is also part of the problem. Every one of the IGs are limited. Now, I have jurisdiction over any money spent on reconstruction in Afghanistan, and I'm unique of any IG, but usually we're stovepiped, and I think that's the problem here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there's so much to cover, and yet I only have five minutes. But Mr. Sopko, thank you for what you do. I think I told you before, when I was in theater, Sopko was a four-letter word. Um, but I, on behalf of the American taxpayer, I sure appreciate what you do in exposing situations like these. Uh, to begin with, on the note of uh, the uniforms, as I understand it, there would have been a memorandum of request that was signed by the commander of c Sticka the Comptroller of c Sticka and others that would have authorized the, the purchase of the uniforms. But in your testimony, you talk about a pattern of issues between November of 2008 and January of 2017. Would that imply that there were numerous memorandums of request, or was there a single uh, MOR that was involved in this procurement? But, but would you would it be safe to assume that there were a number of issues? I mean, you, in your testimony between November 2008 and January 2017, a pattern of issues uh, resulted in what you've exposed. Therefore, there were, as you said, numerous uh, commanders of C-Sticka that would have been involved in these in a pattern of issues throughout those years, rather than a single accountable uh, commander at the beginning at the outset of the procurement. Could you put your microphone on, please? We have found no records in C. Sticka uh, dealing with the one source, the use of the brand name, the acquisition planning, market research, or describing agency needs. So none of those have been signed. And I know where you're getting to, at, at, when you do a sole source over a certain amount, it has to go up the chain. We found nothing. Okay. But, but again, I, I want to emphasize, and I want to move on to something else quickly, but between in your testimony, it says between November 2008 and January 2017, DOD spent approximately $93.81 million to procure uh, X number of uniforms, et cetera. That means a pattern of issues and almost a 10-year span of period, which would lead me to believe rather than stupidity or corruption, as one of my colleagues mentioned, that this is a result of a broken system at the end of the day that needs fixed rather than uh, uh, making accusations about uh, about stupidity or corruption. We don't know until we do the investigation. F fair enough. Moving beyond uniforms, I, I have with me a copy of your 2012 report regarding end-use monitoring findings for vehicles provided to ANSIF. Uh, your data at the time described a total shipment of 30,761 vehicles shipped to ANSIF through 2010. And, and based on my own experience in theater as recently as 2015, I know that we far surpassed that number in 2017. However, while your report from 2012 was generally positive, I'm concerned by the struggles that I witnessed in terms of effective EUM or end-use monitoring of vehicles in theater and the ultimate lack of accountability when it comes to the resources purchased by the American taxpayer. So given our current troop levels, I'm concerned about our ability to track the equipment that we're providing to our Afghan partners, whether weapons and ammunition or uniforms or vehicles, et cetera. Uh, can you describe uh, for us the current environment in Afghanistan when it comes to maintaining accountability of resources provided to ANSIF? And since I've only got a, a minute and less than 20 seconds, can you also describe with a new ambassador chosen in Afghanistan your ability to get out around uh, the country and do the important work that you do uh, or whether or not there are any limitations on your ability to do that with, uh, with the current leadership at the embassy? Uh, real quickly, um, we would have to get back to you on what the state <coughs> is on, on uh, the equipment. I don't have that data. Uh, Mike, please. 
uh, I'll have to get back to you on the uh, equipment. We've done a number of audits, but I, I don't have that data in front of me as to what the status is, and we're happy to get back to you. As to our ability to get around, we've had problems. Over the last year, we've seen a greater reluctance uh, to get out. Now, the security situation has deteriorated. We understand that. But that is a serious problem. Uh, even when we have U.S. military guardian angels protecting us, and even on my last trip, General Nicholson wanted me to visit a site that the U.S. military normally goes to, and we have an MOU with the Department of Defense to get us out there, the ambassador refused to allow me or my staff to go there. So that's problematic. Uh, I, uh, we, there was no objection for security reasons. It was just an objection, and again, the explanation I got was, I'm chief of mission, and I'm the one who's accountable, and I'm not going to let you go. Now, I was surrounded by a lot of guys in green uniforms, and there are green uniforms, not the Afghans, who had a lot of high-powered weapons, and I felt very secure. I've always felt secure. My staff has always felt secure being protected by the U.S. military. But for some reason, the acting ambassador has abrogated our MOU with the Department of Defense and basically installed his restrictions on that. That is a problem. If that continues, we will not have a whole-of-government approach in Afghanistan. We will have a whole in our government approach to Afghanistan. And what that means is, no matter how many troops you give, it's not going to uh, get an answer. I think I'm speaking too long. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schwazi. First of all, thank you very much for your testimony and for your good work that you've done in this instance. Uh, my background, I'm, I'm new to Congress, I'm a, a freshman, uh, but my background is a certified public accountant and an attorney. I was the mayor of a small city and a county executive of a very large county with a $2.8 billion budget. We've heard in our entire lives, everybody in this room, about the $500 hammer. We hear about waste, fraud, and abuse that takes place in huge government enterprises and certainly in the DOD. And uh, more recently, people have come to talk to me about corruption in Iraq and Afghanistan from the, uh, 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 from the Iraq and Afghani side. Um, this, these issues that you're bringing up, I agree with Mr. Congressman Banks, that you know, this is a systemic problem that exists that we need to address. I'm very attracted to the idea when you suggested earlier that you know, we can help to bring a higher profile to some of the work that you're doing, not just by doing hearings like this, but if you can share with us areas that you would like us to probe in further by sending a letter, by making a phone call, by trying to call attention to areas where there is waste that is taking place, where there are bad decisions being made, where procedures and processes don't exist. Uh, Mr. Sopko, Sopko, you've been doing this for a long time. You've been around this stuff for a long time. Is this uh, you know, an isolated incident, do you think, that you're seeing here, or do you see a systemic problem that's taking place? No, it's not isolated, sir. It is a systemic problem. So what can we do to help you to shine a light on these things that are, you know, often this stuff becomes partisan, you know, one party's going against the other party. Now with the change in administration, this is a good time for us to work together on a bipartisan basis to try and make our defense department more efficient and less wasteful. And we're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. And there's got to be opportunities for us to work together as a team to try and identify places that we can improve the procedures and processes to get rid of this waste. Congressman, I'm happy to come up and I can bring my staff up and, and brief any and all of you, including the, the chairman and ranking member, on issues where you can shine that light. And having worked on your side, uh, for 25 years, uh, that is so important. And I, I will take you up on that offer. And Madam Chairman, I, I will take up from the, uh, the ranking member also on any offer you have. We have a lot of areas where you can help us on. And uh, that's the important role of working together. And as I've told people, uh, waste is not red or blue. Waste is green. I, I'm here to try to save the green. And I think all of you are, too. And we are looking for champions such as yourselves to do that. So, And I'm certain all my colleagues from the DODIG and GAO would be happy to do that, too. So we I'm have a list we can give you. I'm going to have a staff member of mine get your numbers, and you're going to get his number. And you're gonna work, his name is Connor. He's in the back right now. And we're going to work together. And you, I'm going to take you up on that briefing idea. If any of my colleagues want to join, certainly. Madam Chair, I don't want to overstep my bounds here. But if you don't mind, uh, I'm going to want to... 
I want to want to pursue this further. I'm very interested in this topic, and I'd like to work with you to try and uh, address this issue. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, contribution, your expertise on this subcommittee. Really, thank, really thank appreciate you so much. that. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to go now to our, our last member of the subcommittee, our newest member, uh, Mr. Jimmy, P Jimmy Panetta. Uh, we want to welcome you. We look forward to uh, having you here on uh, our subcommittee as well as Armed Services Committee. And so uh, I'd be happy to turn it over to you if you have any questions right, right now. Sure. Ma yeah. Madam Chairman, if I may, uh, Representative Panetta is also a former naval intelligence officer and someone who served himself in Afghanistan. So we particularly appreciate your expertise here this afternoon. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Moulton, uh, other members of the subcommittee. Uh, it's an honor to be here, absolute honor uh, to be here. Uh, thank you to the witnesses who came here, who prepared, who testified. I apologize for being late. I did miss some of your testimony. Uh, I was meeting with the uh, Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Richardson. And uh, one of the things we talked about, I told him I was going to my first subcommittee hearing, and it's on oversight. And I said, what do you think, uh, and, you know, and from the Navy, what would be the big change when it came to these types of issues? And he talked about procurement. And he said, you know, for now, right now, and he mentioned a couple of ships, including the Ford, um, Zumwalt, uh, that we're having, they were, he was having issues with. And he talked about how the procurement process is too long, two contracts are too far out, especially with the advances of technology and how quick those are coming now, and that you needed to shorten them, shorten those contracts. Uh, Mr. Sopko, uh, obviously, thank you for your work. Uh, you mentioned uh, your box of broken tools, and the first one you mentioned was procurement. Um, and I don't know if this is something where you're going to come talk to us about, but I think we, uh, right now, um, with the procurement, with an issue like this, how would we make it better? How would we fix that broken tool of procurement? Uh, there's many ways to do that. Uh, the first of all is to eliminate the incentive to spend quickly. Okay. That's one thing. Uh, and that's, an, that's a, uh, 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 something I don't think you can legislate, but uh, you could. But I think the first thing is look at how people rewarded in the contracting office. If that's what they tell you, what they're telling me and my staff out there, then we have a disincentive for good contracting. We just have an incentive for pushing money out the door. Um, I think the other issue is in procurement is the, the files and the records are horrendous. I think one of your colleagues asked before, he said, this is a 10-year contract. Didn't they do X, Y, and Z? We can find no records. They don't keep them. Now, if you were working in the private sector, you'd go to jail for the kind of records that the Department of Defense keeps. Uh, that's something we can maybe learn from the private sector. And somebody here was a certified public accountant. Y you would be shocked at the quality of records. And we did a whole investigation on the Task Force for Business Stabilization and Operation, and we're going to be issuing a uh, final audit on that. And it took us so long because there was nobody in the Department of Defense who could discuss a nearly billion-dollar program. Culture? Laziness? Where'd that come from? No incentive. No incentive. Not my watch. Not my job. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing is, and that goes to um, procurement, is you, you do the procurement, then you're gone. So when the, the proverbial stuff hits the fan, you're in another job. You may be in a whole different area of the world. Mm, that That's goes to your third point of annual problem. turnover, yes. the constant turnover. You mentioned HR. Well, that's the, the whole HR system is we, we, we and for procurement, we, uh, President Reagan was faced with the bill of the up, and I think Congress was at that time. I'm old enough to remember that. And we tried to design a real procurement core where people had incentives to do procurement and to stay with it. And I think that is kind of dissipated. I don't think people are there. But there are probably smarter people in my staff who can give you a list of things to fix procurement. Mm -hmm. And again, we are happy to discuss that. Again, my world is Afghanistan. My colleagues here can speak to GAO, and DOD can also speak of broader issues. You, uh, thank you. You've been doing it a while, and obviously we have the uniform issue. Uh, uh, Mr. Banks talked about uh, an, uh, a vehicle issue. Uh, is this the worst you've seen it? Have you seen? You got worse examples? Oh, far worse. This is de minimis in comparison. We spent eight billion dollars on counter narcotics. Eight billion with a B. And 
There's more drugs being put out now than when we started. Uh, the, the insurgents are getting more drugs money now than before. The insurgents are bribing more Afghan officials than before. Um, we occasionally catch, again, the slow and the lame and those that uh, don't pay the bribes, but that's one of the biggest things. That's $8 billion. Uh, we have buildings that are falling down. We had a building down in uh, Camp Leatherneck, 64,000-square-foot uh, building, the best built building in Afghanistan. The general who was there said, I don't want it, don't build it, I won't use it. His supervisor, General Allen, said, we don't want it, don't build it, we won't use it. By the time it was built, it was built for the surge. By the time it was finished, the surge was over and we were pulling out. We gave the name of the general who was responsible for ignoring General Allen and ignoring the Marine Corps general there. The Department of Defense, and not under the current leadership, I must say, but in the prior leadership, basically said, we didn't find the waste of, 60, of $36 million enough to hold the general accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. We're glad Mr. Jones is joining us today, and we appreciate your interest and your advocacy for wise spending, and I'll turn it over to you. Madam Chairman, thank you, and I thank Mr. Moulton as well. Uh, you know, I've been here 22 years. I was here in 2001 when we voted for the AUMF Authorization Military Force on Afghanistan. I have sat in many, many hearings on the Armed Services Committee, both subcommittee level and full committee. And this is what is just absolutely disgusting to the American people. If this could be on national TV, you'd probably be having rallies out there right now protesting because there is no one held responsible. Mr. Sopko, you and your staff have done numerous reports through the years. I've read quite a few of them, not all, but quite a few of them. You have recommendations in those reports that the American people can see as well as members of Congress. Uh, I think about the stories about ghost soldiers. We pay 200,000 Afghans. Millions and billions of dollars don't even exist. Nobody's accountable for that. Uh, you testified to the Senate, and you told uh, uh, Senator McCaskill, I believe it was, she asked you about the fact that we had bought nine goats for $6 million. Uh, your people look for the goats. You can't find them, and maybe somebody ate them. Nobody knows. <laughs> well, they were from Italy. I remember that. They were from Italy. They were quality goats to start a goat business. It's just one thing after another after another. I do have a question, but I'm going to read. I wrote to uh, President Trump, had it delivered on July the 18th. I wanted him, if he's going to raise the troop levels in Afghanistan, to please come to Congress, ask Congress to meet its constitutional responsibility and to have a debate. After 16 years, we have had no debate on the future of Afghanistan. I want to read this, and I'm going to get to the question. Uh, you also tweeted that year, let's get out of Afghanistan. Our troops are being killed by the Afghanis. We train, and we waste billions there. Nonsense, rebuild the United States of America, excuse me. In addition, I put the next paragraph that, uh, Mr. President, I agree with those remarks, and so does the 31st Commandant of the Marine Corps, my friend and unofficial advisor, General Chuck Krulak. As he said in a recent email to me, no one has ever conquered Afghanistan, and many have tried. We will join the list of nations that have tried and failed. That's Commandant Krulak, not Walter Jones. This is what is, to me, why the taxpayers are so frustrated with members of Congress, because every time we get these hearings, and I want to thank the chairman again and ranking member, we'll keep funding Afghanistan. To your point and the point of the other two witnesses, nobody's ever held responsible. It just goes on and on and on. Our nation is $21 trillion in debt. We're headed for an economic collapse, but yet we will find money to keep spending in Afghanistan. And thank you and all the others who are here today for whatever you're doing to try to bring some accountability to the taxpayer. This is what I've never heard that I'm going to ask, and there's a minute and 40 seconds left. If we have spent over $800 billion in Afghanistan, what percentage of the $800 billion would you estimate should be written off as waste, fraud, and abuse? 5%, 6%, 10%? What would you estimate should be written off as waste, fraud, and abuse out of $800 billion of the taxpayers' money? 
Congressman, I, I again, I'm not trying to avoid the issue. I, I, I can't tell you what percentage. I, I know Stuart Bowen, who was the SIGER in Iraq, came up with a number and was later attacked because he had no basis, and I would have no basis for giving it. All I can say is too much, way too much, billions. But I, I can't tell you what percentage. I'd love to, but I would be spending all my time. I can't get records on ongoing contracts, let or less go back to that. And of course, of that $800 billion, a lot of it is the war fighting. And that's extremely difficult. I mean, did they fire too many shells this day or less? That's more difficult. But I, I really can't tell you. But it's too much was wasted. Well, I guess the last comment, because time's running out, I, I would hope that the Congress would feel, as I do, that we are just as responsible for the waste, fraud, and abuse when we are told by experts like the three of you here today of what's going on, and yet we keep spending billions and billions of dollars, and it just keeps going on and on. It's just like it's endless in a black hole of just money, money going while Americans are being killed there. And so, ma Madam Chairman and Ranking Member, thank you for this time. Yeah, thank you. Now, we do have two panels today, and the Department of Defense officials are coming up here in a minute, but uh, I do want to give members opportunity for a second round of questions. I do have a couple of uh, questions still for this panel I want to uh, address. And with uh, the GAO, um, your, your testimony highlighted the importance of maintaining accountability over the equipment that the DOD provides uh, to Iraq security forces. And you alluded to it in your testimony, but I wonder if you could go into a little bit more details about what is the nature of the interoperability and data reporting issues that you've identified as a potential root cause of the problem, and how can DOD improve them in a meaningful way? So basically, just, just walk through the, the process. We send over some, uh, some guns or some body armor uh, and, and the different steps that are needed and what has been lacking and uh, what you think needs to be done or have they addressed those issues to keep track of everything? Well, as I mentioned, there's three phases, generally speaking, in the process of, of sending the equipment over. So there's the, the, sh the procurement and, sh and shipment from the United States, the staging in Iraq and Kuwait, and then the um, transfer over to the government of Iraq or the courtesy and regional government. Um, we found that you know, only in the very beginning phase, the, the, the procurement and shipment phase, that, that um, the, the dates, the transportation dates were recorded in the, the SCIP system, which is the, the, the Security Cooperation Information Portal, which is a system that should give end-to-end -end uh, visibility to um, the department over where the equipment is in the process. When we looked at the other two phases, we found no dates entered into the system at all. Um, we did not uh, determine the root causes ourselves. We suggested that D we made a recommendation to the department that they should look into the root causes because they are best positioned to understand the interoperability issues that we found. Um, they uh, could not explain exactly why we weren't seeing the dates in the system. We had a lot of discussions with staff, their contractor, and other experts, which is detailed in our report. And it, it seems to us that they should be able to sort of under look under all of this and, and understand better uh, where, where the breakdowns are. Um, they did ask for our underlying data so that they could pinpoint some of the, the information that we were not seeing and try to go backwards and look from there. So I think that's a question that hopefully the um, second panel will be able to, 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 to address. Do they have, do, does our equipment have the identification number, like a barcode or something that can be scanned at various stages along the way, uh, like, you know, FedEx and Amazon and post office and other people do? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking back at my team. Um, yeah, it, it does have, there are identifiers, there's case identifiers that are associated in the system as well as individual equipment and procurement. There's so you say the dates weren't entered, so does that require somebody to type the date in, I mean like scan it with a barcode scan and then record it, or can they just scan it? Um, well, I think for the dates themselves, um, there's a couple of different ways that they're entered into the system. Either users can enter them into the system or the dates are pulled from other DOD sources. So there may be an external data system. There's a couple of different um, information suites that we describe also in detail in our report that um, are used to pull the, date, the dates from, um, but the, sometimes the dates are in those systems but not showing up in the security cooperation information portal. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna follow up with this more with the DOD officials, but I did wanna ask a, a, another question of Mr. Um, 
Rourke, today if the committee were to request that DOD provide the immediate quantity, dollar value, and location of equipment on hand in Kuwait and Iraq, how quickly do you estimate that information could be found, and is the Department working on a system to improve record keeping? So the, uh, we asked the same question during our audits. Uh, so uh, one of the biggest problems that we found was uh, automated systems weren't being used. So a lot of things were based on individual spreadsheets and so forth. So we recommended that the command uh, implement some more uh, uh, recognized army accountability and uh, visibility systems. And so the command uh, wrote me back last week uh, when I asked for a follow-up to see what had happened over the last few months. And they indicated that they have implemented a automated system called the Global Combat Support System-Army. Uh, so that would be uh, the system that they're using as of last week. And uh, that, that would be the first place to go to try to get that information. Okay, very good. I I think we've checked. There's no other questions on this round, so we want to thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, now we'll move on to the uh, second panel. And as they're making the transition there, I'm going to go ahead and uh, with the introductions. On this panel, we're going to be joined by Colonel David uh, Nav Navratil, the country director for Iraq at the office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy and Mr. Peter Vells, the Director for Afghanistan, Resources and Transition at the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy. So we appreciate you gentlemen being here and uh, sitting through the first panel and uh, that will probably be very helpful to you, uh, be getting our, your, your testimony and questions. You know some of the, the issues that have been raised by the subcommittee and some questions and so, uh, you know, we appreciate you addressing those. Um, so would you please uh, go ahead and proceed with your, your statements? <coughs> Chairman, Chairwoman Hart Hartzler, Ranking Member Moulton, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting Department of Defense witnesses to testify here today, and thank you for the unwavering support that you and the defense committees give to the men and women of the Department of Defense military and civilian al alike who serve and defend our country all over the world. I am pleased to be here today to discuss the Department of Defense's efforts to ensure that taxpayers' funds used to train, equip, and sustain partner forces in Afghanistan are effectively managed and deliver results in support of our national security objectives. You have our written testimony, so we will each provide a brief overview of the key points. Secretary Mattis has made it clear that even small instances of inefficient or ineffective use of DOD funds can have strategic impacts that can reverberate negatively on the DOD mission and our budget situation, and that we must earn the trust and confidence of Congress and the American people that, are diligent that we are diligent stewards of taxpayer dollars. The Secretary expects all DOD organizations to, e to end wasteful practices in any mission area and to bring forward proposals that make the Department more effective and efficient. This guidance cer certainly applies to the Department's management of the Afghanistan Security Forces Fund, or the ASIF, which is the uh, subject of Mr. Sopko's uh, testimony, and all other DOD partner capacity building appropriations. The Department greatly appreciates the strong support from Congress in general and the Defense Committees in particular for the ASIF appropriation. This appropriation is the center of gravity of the DOD mission in Afghanistan. It has enabled the United States, the United States and our coalition partners to transition responsibility for the security of Afghanistan to the Afghan Defense and Police Forces. The Afghan forces have shown over the last two and a half years since the end of the U.S. combat mission that with limited U.S. enabler assistance, they have, they have been able to prevent the insurgency from achieving its strategic objectives, including capturing and holding a major city. The Afghan forces have also proven to be very capable and critical partners in our counterterrorism efforts in Afghanistan. The work by the DODIG, the SIGAR, and GAO are critical enablers of, of the department's oversight and our oversight of the uh, ASIF and the Afghanistan mission. Throughout the course of audits, investigations, and other projects, and through implementation of recommendations and, and uh, production of their statutorily required quarterly reports to Congress, my office in the uh, Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, uh, as well as our commanders in the field and their staffs work closely with the DODIG and SIGAR 
each of which have a robust presence in Kabul, Afghanistan, to identify opportunities for improvement. We also work closely with GAO in their efforts to support congressional oversight requirements. These interactions with oversight organizations provide valuable insights into our efforts to implement the Secretary's guidance to effectively manage these funds while achieving the critically important national security outcomes for which these funds are intended. The Department's congressionally chartered Afghanistan Resources Oversight Council, or the AROC, which has statutory authority to approve acquisition strategies and funding requirements for ASA funded procurements, uses the results of, of IG work as a key input in the decision making and oversight. Um, and I would note that the, the Secretary Mattis letter that you referenced, um, it was directed to the three chairs of the AROC. So he, he intended uh, those three principles to um, uh, be, be accountable for the actions of the department in, in specifically in the ASAF area. Um, we also use regular internal DOD staff interactions among OSD policy staff, joint staff, CENTCOM, and commanders in the field to ensure a common understanding of actions that are needed to improve accountability for the use of ASIF and to take appropriate corrective action when needed. Regarding the CIGAR report on Afghan National Army uniforms, we agreed with CIGAR's suggestion that a DOD organization with expertise in military uniforms should conduct an analysis of whether there might be a more effective a more cost-effective uniform design and camouflage pattern that meets operational requirements. We believe this is the best way to determine the merits of the report's claim that DOD may have spent as much as $28 million over 10 years uh, more than was needed on uniforms that may be inappropriate, inappropriate for Afghanistan's operational environment. The, the uh, appropriate DOD experts have begun developing a, developing a plan for conducting the study, which we expect to begin in the coming weeks. Secretary Mattis has made it clear in a recent memo to the three undersecretaries who are chairs of the AROC, as, as I mentioned, that rather than minimize this report or excuse wasteful decisions, DOD should use it as a catalyst to take aggressive steps to, to end waste in our department. The, the bottom line is the department must continually, continually seek ways to improve and enhance existing oversight of ASIF, just as we must across all of DOD's mission areas whether that involves providing assistance to our partner forces in Afghanistan and Iraq or ensuring the readiness of U.S. forces. As Secretary Mattis wrote in a memo to DOD personnel in, on his first day as Secretary of Defense, quote, every action we take will be designed to ensure our military is ready to fight today and in the future, unquote. Um, Madam Chairwoman, thank you again for inviting us to participate in this hearing, and I welcome any questions you or other members of the committee may have. Thank Subcommittee. you. Sorry. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate appreciate you being here, and I, I very much appreciate Secretary Mattis's uh, very very uh, prompt and and timely uh, statement on this that we need to get accountable and look into all of this. I think that's uh, what is needed. Certainly, I did want to follow up on the uh, subject of the uniforms um, in our. NDAA, we did put language in there uh, requesting that this be looked at, and one of the recommendations is that the cost and feasibility of transitioning the uniforms of the Afghan military security forces to a pattern owned by the United States using existing excess inventory where available and acquiring the rights. That's something that is supposed to be looked at, and I know that you've just said that a uh, study is going to be done by DOD, but I wanted to ask your opinion about that. How much excess inventory do we have currently of uniforms? And if we were to give those to the Afghan security forces, does that uh, jeopardize our own security uh, by having a foreign government wearing the same uniform perhaps that uh, we had worn at least in the past? So can you kind of explain the excess inventory we may or may not have and the viability of perhaps using this in this situation? Uh, Madam Chairwoman, I'll, ha I'll have to get you the specifics on how much each of the services may have as excess. I know that, for example, um, there, there might be some uh, quantity of, of older woodland uniforms. I, I don't know for sure that the Army might have. Um, but, um, you know, what's excess and what's just in the inventory but not currently used and, and being, with, being held? For eventual distribution is is a is a, a fine fine science to, to determine. So I'd, I'd like to get you a specific answer and uh, for the record on how much is available. In general, um, I, I th 
I think uh, it's probably best to, to focus on trying to make sure that we determine what is the actual best operationally suitable uh, camouflage pattern and design uh, that is cost effective for the Afghan forces. The, uh, the statute, uh, the uh, 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 Hask Amendment um, on requiring that study, I think it's, it's entirely parallel with what we've signed up to do in the Cigar Report. Okay. That'll be very interesting to see, certainly, uh, the cost involved if you switched it totally over and whether you use excess inventory or whether you uh, try to replace it. It sounds costly to me, but um, I would like to ask uh, Colonel Navratil, since you uh, oversee Iraq and that issue, can you kind of go into detail about what steps have been taken to address the record-keeping issue that the GAO, uh, as well as Inspector General of DOD, identified? And have you coordinated with any private companies in our country, whether it be UPS or FedEx or uh, any others, on logistics and how they keep track of inventory? Uh, have you incorporated any of their ideas? Madam Chairwoman, thank you for that question. Uh, there have been several steps taken by uh, mostly the first theater sustainment command, as the IG and GAO reported, is the theater sustainment headquarters, the logistic headquarters in charge of all this equipment going through to Iraq and through Kuwait. So as Inspector General mentioned, on site after some issues were identified immediately, the first TSC and subordinate units took steps to either uh, properly safeguard the equipment, banding and packaging sealing boxes, or uh, replacing holes and fences that were identified by the Inspector General. So those are a couple things to point to. For the GAO report, it's been only a couple months since uh, those issues were identified, but I can tell you we work closely again with First TSC, and what they've done is uh, update their standard operating procedures, ensured that their subordinate units below them, there are at least three mentioned in the report, follow those procedures. What, uh, GEO didn't mention in great detail is, is we're going to be working with them probably for a year or more, I would estimate, on some kind of system. And, and they have an automated system, and we've heard reference to skip the security cooperation inf information portal that we're using, and also GCSS Army, which is an Army, of course, you can tell by the name, Army internal system that uh, maintains accountability for all Army units. But what we want to do is find the root cause using the security cooperation information portal and trace it back to the uh, the people here at Defense Security Cooperation Agency, where the order is essentially placed, to the points of shipment from the U.S., and finally to receipt in CONUS, whether Kuwait or Iraq, wherever the final destination is, and kind of find out where the system is, is broke and the process is not being followed. Because at this point, we're not sure for that process that it's, uh, it's an IT issue or just a following the instructions issue. So we, we've heard GAO and Cigar mention that some of these forces rotate through theater at periodic intervals. Army standard is nine months on ground and then back at home station for at least twice that long. So keeping the knowledge base is important, especially in written procedures, but uh, not exactly sure the context when these investigations were performed, what the situations were to see the unsecured weapons and the problems with the database. So you feel confident the database is adequate, it's just a matter of personnel training and people not following procedure? Ma'am, at this point, I, I cannot conjecture on, on the exact cause. So I said, it, we're not taking our time, but we're moving forward systematically with general accounting or gen, GAO to find out the steps from start to finish and where it's broken. What, what we do know is first TSC has changed some procedures. So what we're going to do is measure the, uh, the information in the portal since May, when they've updated their SOP, they changed procedures. We'll see what kind of reaction we have to that. And then we'll just kind of narrow it down to the root cause and work backwards and kind of reverse engineer the problem. So we'll find out if it's not on first TSC, where in the system it's broke. We don't, we're not sure the system is broke, the information technology system's broke, or the procedures at this point. We, we think it's probably a combination of the two. We just want to make sure we find this and identify it so we can be better like some of the civilian companies you mentioned. What was that last phrase? Because I was going to ask, did, have you, it sounds like you have not uh, visited with any private companies on how they do logistics. You're just trying to address this internally or? No, ma'am, we have, we have not yet. Let me okay. caveat that. We have not yet. It's a great idea. I'll have to ask uh, some folks in the logistics community what they have done in the past because I know the Army's transition, I've been in about 24 plus years, 
since I first got in, it was all internal army units delivering parts and other things by supply system. And we transitioned to using commercial supply systems, whether overseas or CONUS. And it worked very well CONUS. Oh, CONUS, it worked in some cases. Not sure why it's not used more. I mean, I have a feeling some of these bulk procurements, the heavy lifts are better done by transcom and mobility forces. But I will have to find out more information for you on that question because I think it's valid. Thank you. Uh, Ranking Member Moulton. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, going first to Afghanistan, uh, Mr. Vels, could you talk about uh, the what changes DOD made uh, in response to this to this particular incident? Uh, you talked about how uh, I, you think that we did the right thing here on the committee by instituting this requirement. Uh, I would certainly like to think that that kind of thing is not required in the future. So what changes has, D has DOD actually made? Uh, Ranking Member Moulton, um, I, I think the Secretary's memo that he just sent to the AROC principals, the Under Secretaries for Policy, ATL and Comptroller will really be the catalyst. So it's safe to say no changes have been made to date. Um, that the report has been out for about a month. Um, the the primary suggestion in the report was that we determine whether or not there is a, a uniform pattern that is more suitable. So certainly that was something that was not done ten years ago in two thousand seven. There wasn't a, a you know a real requirement study that that is normally done for for something like this. Um, that is what we are going to do now. Uh, the new commander of CSTICA uh, is, is supportive of that approach. Um, and so, th so that's how we're, we're remedying this immediate issue. The broader issue you're talking about, though, as, as far as accountability for other aspects of execution of ASIF, I think that will flow from the, the Secretary's memo to the AROC principals. And then, you know, that will probably lead to further implementation guidance and um, uh, more rigorous structures and oversight by those principles of, of uh, decisions to, to expend ASIF. So could you comment for a second on some of the recommendations made by the Special Instructor General, uh, Inspector General? Uh, some of the things that he said about everything from uh, rotations of units and commanders uh, down to contracting procedures and incentives and, and whatnot. Uh, did you agree with most of what he had to say? Did you have specific areas where you disagreed? I really appreciate DOD's perspective on this. Sir, I think in some of those areas, uh, I think there is a recognition within the department at, at the senior levels that, that are involved in Afghanistan that those are, those are issues and concerns. Um, there, is, uh, there, there are short-term rotations of people in, into theater. Uh, they may not have the exact expertise that's needed for the more complex jobs that, that are done in, in the security assistance arena, for example. Um, when Congressman uh, Banks was there, I think you probably saw some of this firsthand. Um, and, and those are things that we're very cognizant of. Uh, uh, General Nicholson is very cognizant of them. Um, uh, we're looking at things like uh, making significant improvements to advisor training bef before advisors deploy. Um, uh, there are, we, we also are, we have put in place structures in the last two years or so, uh, uh, a, a governance board, if you will, that, that my, my uh, immediate boss is the chairman of, that is bringing together people who've been advisors over the last two or three or four years to stay part of the dialogue um, so that they don't just do their year and, and wander off into DOD and they, they never are heard from again. So that, that's a mechanism that can bring in continuity of mission, and, and that's a really important um, uh, a principle f for it because as people rotate in and out, they lose corporate knowledge. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to put in place structures that maintain that corporate knowledge. So uh, just going to Iraq for a minute, uh, Colonel Navratil, uh, what sort of timeline should we expect uh, to see the changes, the increased accountability, the improvements in security uh, that you discussed? Uh, I am the co-chair of the Iraq caucus here in the House of Representatives, and we're going to be making a trip to uh, Iraq this fall. We'd like to know uh, what we can expect to see by then and, and, and where to find it. Yes, sir. I, I think talking to IG, like I said, we work pretty well with IG. Uh, it sounds like the improvements have been done. Either a work order has been implemented to fix the fence, they've changed to a new location with a more secure perimeter, 
and the boxes and crates that were identified before in the previous report are already banded up and better secured. So it sounds like those two instances are done. But I agree with the IG where he wants to see it. They have to see pictures. I have to do an on-site visit just to visit, just to make sure that it is done for one. And for two, in the future when we see more packages, they continue these updated security procedures. For the, I, the GAO report, it's a little more complex, but I, I own an action plan very shortly. I'd say within 30 days. I mean, as far as working with GAO, I mean, I'm, I won't be ready to brief Congress within 30 days. But at least the GAO are working out some kind of timeline on this action plan. And we already started the work uh, a month or so ago, initial discussions, but it, it's a big project. And, and uh, speaking of accountability, which I know is a big discussion on the previous panel, I mean, I won't be in DOD and OSD for more than another year, but I, I fully expect this project to follow me wherever I end up. So. I'll make sure it's completed, whether it's by myself or handing off to somebody who replaces me. But this is a big project, so I, I think within within the quarter, we'll have a solid plan as we figure out what the actual problems are in the system. And probably within a quarter after that, we'll have buy-in with the system, if you will. Probably mostly in the Army system up through Defense Quality Security Cooperation Agency to get this fix-it plan in place. Well, we would certainly appreciate follow-up, and my staff and the committee staff can help uh, get that follow-up from, from you. Uh, if you have this plan within 30 days, and say in about 40 days, we would appreciate a, a, a brief on it, uh, because that would be an anticipation of our uh, trip to Iraq, uh, where we hope to see uh, some of these changes and improvements. And you know, to me, the, the bigger issue than a few boxes with holes in them is really the fundamental accountability in the system and ensuring that that, uh, that is fixed. You know, it also strikes me that w we have spent literally tens of millions of dollars delivering uh, weapons to the Iraqis. The same could be said about Afghanistan, but to focus on Iraq for a second, tens of millions of dollars of, of, of weapons, equipment, et cetera. There are plenty of pictures on the internet that we see today of ISIS using many of those pieces of equipment, weapons, and associated ammunition against us. You know, at what point does Iraq have enough weapons? At what point are there enough weapons in the country that we should stop just spending millions of American taxpayer dollars on putting more guns on the ground in Iraq? So sure, that's a great question. And I cannot provide a very detailed answer on that. What I can say is we do not yet have what the government of Iraq and what CENTCOM and the commanders in the DOD think are enough hold forces to protect these areas after ISIS has been defeated, like for Mosul, recent example. So we continue to work with the government of Iraq by, with, and through them, and with our coalition partners, but it, we're not at the point yet. A lot are destroyed. Some highly visible examples, you know, the weapons may be compromised or stolen or whatever the case may be, uh, given to people who should not have them. But those are things if, as we identify them, we work through the government of Iraq to take care of that situation. And they take those seriously. I can't say they get many results getting them back or what actions they do take, but they, they take those seriously. And we talk to them all the time if we find any violation of that sort. If you came to me and you said, you know, uh, Congress, we really need to appropriate some money to send some oil to Iraq, because Iraq's running short on oil, we would say that seems a little absurd because there's an awful lot of oil in Iraq. Well, at some point, there are enough guns in Iraq that we shouldn't be buying more, that we should tell the Iraqis to get the guns off the street or wherever else they need to get them from or from the insurgents and, and start putting them back into their inventory. It seems to me, I mean, maybe I'm being too logical about this, but uh, at, at some point, uh, this is not a good use of American taxpayer dollars. No, sir, and I, I don't want to make an excuse for what we're doing because... I mean, I'm not the commander on the ground. I, I know as we fight ISIS and we continue to fight them, and there's probably a year or two, maybe more left, as we fight them and, and eradicate them in Iraq, you know, we continually arm the soldiers that we're arming in the Iraqi security forces, some of the partnered vetted forces that we're working with, with ITEF support uh, provided by Congress. So at some point, we are going to cut the weapons off. Uh, I would just offer a data point that this war is, is very cheap compared to previous OIF and OND, as, as you're probably aware. So it, I hate to compare it, but economy of scale, it's, it's very, it's a lot better this way. And when you look at the American people who have sacrificed in this war as well, there have only been, I think, six over the past three years that have died in hostile acts. So I mean, a couple of measurements, but I just think at some point, you're correct, we will cut them off, but that point is not yet. 
Okay, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gates. Thank you, Madam Chair. Colonel, no one is really responsible for overseeing end use of equipment that we provide once we provide it to the Iraqi military, isn't that right? So that's, that's not quite accurate. The Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq has that responsibility on them. And how would you assess their performance? Uh, that is a difficult one to answer. But it, what I will tell you, it, it's a difficult environment, and I, I won't make excuses for them. We all know there's a lot of conflict in Iraq, and uh, those folks are over there trying to do a good job. What, what they do is work with, through the GOI, Government of Iraq, through the various ministries, to get reports back, usually at a quarterly reporting cycle. Yeah, I'm, I'm speaking more to outcomes and less about process. So if we were to evaluate not the process that they use, but the outcomes, would you say they've been effective at managing end use or ineffective at managing end use? So I'm going to cut it down the middle and say so-so. I mean, I know there is a DSA report, I think from last year, that said they need improvement. But I, I can't get into that many more specific on this topic because we weren't really prepared for this. Okay, well, so in 2015, Senator McCain said that, the, and I'm quoting here, the Iraqi military is a long way from being prepared to act in an impactful fashion. Meanwhile, the vacuum is being filled by Shia militias that are Iranian-backed, and he continued, some of those arms have come from the United States of America. So is the statement from Senator McCain accurate that the U.S. has allowed arms that are our arms to fall in the hands of Shia militia? Sure, I would never contradict anything Senator McCain said, but what, what I can say is, I mean, allowed is, is kind of an exaggeration, and, and I'm not saying he exaggerated, but some equipment, U.S. equipment bought for ISF has more than likely found its way into enemy hands, whether, and I don't want to lump all the PMF into enemy, but some of them have strong Shia backing, some strong Iranian ties. We all know this, reading the paper. So... Uh, the same as before, when we determine these situations exist, we work with state and our partners through the government of Iraq and the ministries to get those back in proper hands. And we're, we deal with these issues infrequently, but when we do, we treat them very seriously because, we're, we're like you all know, we're, we're putting a lot of money into this country trying to support them and enable them to govern and police themselves. That's a serious concern for us. Madam Chair, I would uh, like to seek unanimous consent to enter into our subcommittee's record a January 8, 2015 Bloomberg News article titled, Iran-backed militias are getting U.S. weapons. So ordered. And uh, Madam Chair, I also would seek unanimous consent to enter into our subcommittee's records a series of photographs showing U.S. tanks, U.S. equipment, uh, all flying under the flags of Iranian Shia militias. So ordered. Uh, my final question, Colonel, is what can we do to move from so-so performance on the management of end use to improved performance where the warfighters from my district and the districts of my colleagues all over the country are not having to fight against American equipment? Sir, it's, it's, at this point, it is partly a process of procedures, partly pro uh, sorry, it, it's dependent on security and some is dependent on procedures and people following procedures. I, th I think for the most part, people know what the procedures are. We have written procedures, very easy to follow usually in the Army. We, we do it that way for a reason. Uh, the situation we're in right now, it's getting better in Iraq. There's still a lot of fighters, a lot of ISIS out there, so it's not as easy to get out and, and follow up as we should. But at least for the very visible uh, incidents like the pictures you mentioned there, there's a lot of pressure from up high, and Secretary Mattis is, of course, tracking that very closely to get the tanks where they should be, to get other weapons and equipment. If it's in the wrong hands, back to where it should be. It's a delicate situation now with you know counterbalancing Iranian influence with all the other countries that are surrounding Iraq and may want some part of that country after this fight is done. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Madam Chairman, thank you again. And uh, uh, Mr. Vales, I think you and I met a few months ago when I wrote the former Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, to please explain to me how we made the mistake of taking the taxpayers' money and paying over 200,000 Afghans uh, who didn't exist. The article said ghost soldiers, and I expressed that in the letter. You and Mr. Royal, very kind, came to chat with me about that. and. Uh, I, the only thing I, I took from the 
discussion was that they're changing the uh, metrics on uh, how they keep up with uh, who we're paying for this and that. I still don't question you or Mr. Royal, but I still think it's an impossible situation, but that's my problem, not yours. Last night, uh, I saw um, Peter Walsh, I believe his name is, with CNN, with Marines, I don't know if it was Hellman, but somewhere in Afghanistan, that uh, they were waiting for the Afghan unit to come in to help them with a possible firefight. I think they uh, were, the unit was about 500 Afghan soldiers. It ended up that they got less than 100 soldiers. So again, that just adds to the frustration of our military, I'm sure, but also the taxpayers and those of us who represent the taxpayers. Also this morning, I get in the office around seven o'clock and I turn on the TV, and then I hear that the Russians are now doing a, a quite a, a extensive uh, supply of weapons to the Taliban. As we know, the Taliban are make up the uh, Afghan people. Most of them are Pashtuns. They've been fighting for a thousand years and probably will for the next thousand years. Uh, and I said to you and Mr. Royal, and I know we're going to try to get together in September, I just don't know how in the world, when I hear the testimony, I want to thank again the chairwoman uh, and also Mr. Moulton. This has been an excellent uh, hearing, uh, and I think that it should be national TV. I said that early, I understand. But when we get to a point that we are spending billions and billions and billions in Afghanistan and to stand up, and particularly what's distressed me, I represent Camp Lejeune, I represent Cherry Point Marine Air Station, uh, when I know that these Marines that I talked to who have been there many, many times feel that there is nothing that's, that's changing. I don't expect you to tell me today in two minutes that everything's changed, I understand that. But it's the accountability that I think is missing. I don't know why someone cannot say to the Congress, you have spent uh, close to $800 billion. Uh, we've been training the Afghans for 16 years. I, I, honest to God, I don't mean this too ugly, but you can train monkeys to ride a bicycle in 16 years. But we keep training and training, and half the people that we're training end up going with the Taliban. And a few of those we are training, they killed uh, two Marines from my district, Major Palmer, Benjamin Palmer, and, and Sergeant Kevin uh, Baldiff. They both were shot and killed by the Afghans they were training. And just uh, in the last month, there were three Army fellows who were shot and trained uh, by the people they were training. And at some point in time, somebody's got to be honest with the American people and the Congress and say to us, what is the benchmark? What are we trying to do? This 16 years cannot become 32 years. I'll be dead and gone. But so, we'll, so America would be financially broke. When is the truth going to be told as to what we're trying, what is the benchmark? Sir, I think, uh, first of all, thank you for your, your comments and questions. Um, uh, I, I, th I think uh, the, the main answer to your question will, will be when we, uh, when we get a decision from President Trump on our strategy and policy in Afghanistan that is under review right now. Secretary Mattis, Secretary Tillerson, uh, National Security Advisor McMaster have been in uh, uh, discussions with him about that. I think they are very close to making a final recommendation and decision on what our posture will be going forward. And, and that, the outcome of that I think will, will include some uh, points that can address your, your concerns, sir. Thanks. So I, I, don't, I, I can't offer you anything more on that. Um, I can just, uh, I'll, if, if you don't mind, sir, just a couple quick comments on some of your other points. Um, on the, the situation in Helmand, that has long been the, the most difficult uh, security uh, environment, most difficult um, uh, area of responsibility within Afghanistan. And, and the problems of the uh, Afghan National Army Corps in that area are well known and have been the focus of a lot of attention over the last couple of years. Um, there are other parts of Afghanistan where the Afghan Army and the Afghan police, uh, and certainly the Afghan Special Forces are, are frankly uh, better organized, better led, 
uh, although there have been leadership changes in the, in the 215th Corps that are beginning to show improvements, but it still remains a work in progress. Um, but sir, the key metric I would hold out for you as to Afghan will uh, uh, is the number of casualties that they are suffering. Um, seven or 8,000 a year, KIA, uh, 14 or 15,000 wounded in action. Um, I, I think there's no question about the will of the Afghan soldier and police to fight. Uh, there are questions about whether they are all adequately led as, as we would like them to be, uh, in some cases perhaps not adequately equipped and supplied, but, but they are doing the bulk of the fighting. Our combat forces are providing uh, minimal support right now. Our special forces are working with the Afghan special forces who are highly, highly capable and are doing, uh, uh, having a lot of uh, successful counterterrorism counter operations. Um, but I, I would just note that the, the, it's, it's the Afghans fight now. We're there to support. They are fully responsible for the security of their country. The U.S. and dozens of other coalition partners are assisting them. And, and sir, I, I, th I think, um, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, w once we have a decision from President Trump, I think we'll be able to have more in-depth discussions on your, your question. I want to thank the witnesses today for your testimony as well as your service to our nation. Uh, this concludes our hearing.